So um, welcome everybody to this cycle of conferences uh, entitled Situating Space Technology Between Lab and Field uh, Sciences. Uh, it is sponsored by the Catalan Society for the History of Science and Technology. Um, before beginning, I must inform that we are recording this session and that it will be available uh, on the internet. So if any of the audience don't want to be, uh, doesn't want to be recorded, I would kindly ask uh, you to leave the room now. So thank you. Um, so this cycle uh, seeks to place satellite history, um, usually or most often, treated as paradigmatic examples of big science or laboratory science, um, this cycle interrogates uh, its relationship to field science and, and, and natural history practices. Uh, we bring together three scholars, excellent scholars, experts in different aspects of the history of science and technology, uh, but that they all encounter in some various and distinct ways uh, this question of lab and field uh, sciences as it applies to earth orbiting satellites. Uh, today, Professor Christine Harper will be lecturing in relation to meteorology. Next Wednesday, Sebastian Grebsmuel of CNRS in France. And the following Wednesday, uh, on 17 February, uh, Professor Chang Ling Fa of the University of Amsterdam. So I really appreciate them uh, and they're willing to take part to take part of this conversation. Um, yes, today, after, Christine's, after Christine Harper's talk, Sebastian Grefsmo will provide some brief comments, and then we will open a discussion to all. Um, as usual, you can leave your comment on the chat, or um, you can raise your hand uh, and, uh, and to pose your comment in voice. And But that being said, uh, please feel free to express uh, whatever thoughts come to your mind during, also during the talk uh, using the chat option. Um, so let me now introduce Christine, our first speaker. Um, Christine Harper is professor of history and philosophy of the earth sciences at Copenhagen University, a meteorologist and oceanographer for 20 years. She completed her PhD at Oregon State University. Her research focuses on the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. Her latest book is Make It Rain, State Control of the Atmosphere in 20th Century America. It was published in 2017 and it won the Louis Baton Award from the American Meteorological Society. She is also the author of Weather by the Numbers, published in 2008, and co-editor of Exploring Greenland, Cold War Science and Technology on Ice, 2016. Her current research focuses on desalination efforts in the mid 20th century. So it is an honor to have her here today. Uh, thank you, Christine, for your generosity. And it's your turn now. OK, thank you so much, Emma, for that kind introduction. And I'll go ahead and share my screen here. OK, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so as Yemen noted, I'm going to be looking at um, the field lab interface in meteorology, particularly as it relates to um, the use of satellites. So um, looking at observations from the ground looking up and observations from satellites looking down. So weather, uh, which is the ongoing state of the atmosphere, has been the object of human interest for millennia. While all of the field sciences that emerged from the natural history tradition starting in the late 18th and into the early 19th century stemmed from human interest in the surroundings that ensured or threatened their survival, I would argue that the atmosphere was the entity that was quite literally in everyone's face from birth to death. The state of the atmosphere, the weather and its longer term companion, the climate, determined the types of shelter and clothing needed for protection. It also determined the availability of food and water needed for survival. And although our long ago ancestors were not scientists, they were careful observers of their surroundings because their lives depended on it. 
Over time, they associated changing weather patterns with changes in the night sky and adjusted their behavior accordingly. Eventually, those observations of wind direction <clears throat> and intensity, types and amounts of precipitation, and the relative warmth or coolness of the day were recorded. People made generalizations about weather conditions and became more adept at reading changing wind directions and cloud patterns for clues about future weather. If it was good on the positive side, they were able to carry out their daily lives. And they could also use that same good weather to launch attacks against their neighbors. It just depended on what they wanted to do. Writings that have come down from classical Greece and Rome make clear that there was much interest in the weather, not only from natural philosophers, but from poets, farmers, and physicians with clear predictive ties to astronomical data. Starting in the 15th century and moving forward, this observational interest in the atmosphere was supplemented with the first instruments including relatively primitive methods for measuring relative humidity, wind speed and direction, atmospheric temperature and pressure. And over time, these observations took on a more systemic quality as European science academies attempted to establish synoptic networks that would record daily weather information over a large area, leading to international efforts to look for patterns that are only possible with widespread cooperation. Additionally, as those with a scientific bent traveled further afield, they were able to gather information on storm systems that did not occur in Europe, including hurricanes, tornadoes, and seasonal monsoon flows. By the 18th century and the rise of laboratory science, greater efforts were extended toward the development of more accurate instruments and their deployment to observatories, where more detailed records were kept but they were not consistently kept nor of more uniform quality until the 19th century when many nations established their own weather systems. Since some countries were very small, Belgium for example, and their weather and climate patterns did not vary widely across the country, they often started with just one observation site and slowly added more as time went on. International sharing of information was not far behind, and the first international conferences and congresses were underway by mid-century as meteorology became a full-fledged science. While the earliest work of scientific societies related to the atmosphere had focused on standardizing instrumentation and measurements, later meetings focused on international cooperation surrounding the sharing of both data and ideas as instrumentation continued to improve and new methods of gathering information, including the introduction of kites and balloons to carry instruments aloft, which enabled scientists to systematically study atmospheric layers for the first time took place. The introduction of physics and mathematics in the late 18th century, which led Norwegian geophysicist Wilhelm Bjerknes's to, to Norwegian geophysicist, whoops. Um, Wilhelm Bjerknes's polar front theory for weather prediction in the early 20th century, and later led to international agreements that standardized observation times and techniques moving meteorology onto a firmer scientific footing. But despite advances in instrumentation, standardized methods and international data sharing, and the introduction of physics and mathematics, meteorology remained a field science, totally dependent on people. Not just trained observers who had gained their skill by learning on the job in their national, civil or military weather services, but thousands of volunteer observers from all walks of life going outside several times a day and recording temperature and pressure, wind direction and speed, cloud types and the extent of cloud cover, precipitation types and amounts, and either transmitting them directly from official observing stations or saving them up until the end of the month and mailing them in for climatology studies. And here are some of the instruments that they were using. So we have barometers, a sling psychrometer here, 
was used for uh, computing uh, relative humidity. And this, amazingly enough, was a tipping bucket rain gauge. So there's a little um, tipper thing here. And as, as the rain came in and there was a certain amount of rain in this side, it would tip and empty. And then the other side would fill up. And then you just needed to count the tips to figure out how much rain you had gotten, which was pretty sophisticated for the late 1800s. In addition to these surface observations on land, shipboard personnel, both civilian and military, also transmitted surface observations via radio or teletype, and now via satellite, providing the same information as land observers, in addition to sea conditions, so sea surface temperature, sea and swell heights. Don't want to go there yet. Sea and um, sea and swell heights um, and presence of ice and the location and track of the ships, which you had needed to keep track of. Upper air stations, both on land and aboard certain military and civilian merchant ships, measure temperature, pressure, and humidity and provide wind direction and speed data through tracking as they ascend through the atmosphere providing information on the atmospheric layers where weather is happening and influence. Every day, we also get upper air data from thousands of aircraft, although not so many now due to COVID, as pilots report weather conditions along their flight routes. In the case of hurricanes, we also get upper air data courtesy of people in hurricane hunter aircraft gathering crucial information on hurricane structure and strength. So originally, um, people went up in balloons and took the instruments with them. This is um, an image from um, uh, the late 1800s. And our uh, trusty observers there are dumping uh, sand out so that they can go up. And they've got their equipment so that they can make measurements in their balloon. But of course, that wasn't a real practical um, method. Um, later on, we used aircraft. And here you can see um, in this uh, biplane, we have a, what was called a meteograph. And so all of the uh, data collection equipment was tucked inside of the box and it would record the information. And then they would take it back home. Um, and notice the open cockpit. So they couldn't go too high, um, but at least they could, they could get up there and, and fly around. Uh, more promising were these kites. And so um, the kites were large, um, as you can kind of see from this one over here. This is the mediograph here that's tacked onto the kite. And these kites came in different sizes, um, depending on how far up in the atmosphere they wanted them to go. And they were tethered by piano wire um, down to a device that's sitting down here, and it would um, let the piano wire go, and then it would reel them back in at the end. So we had kites that were part of this. And then we had um, radio sons were introduced. And so the radio sond itself is this little box of gear here. And it measures temperature and pressure and humidity as it goes up. And they can be tracked by a person. Here's the person here. They can be tracked by a person, and uh, you can figure out what the wind direction of and speed is aloft. And then when the balloon pops, they float down. The little box floats down courtesy of this parachute. And all of this verbiage on the side says, please put this in your local mailbox and mail it back to the US Weather Bureau, because they're quite expensive. This is still done today. Um, and so people find these. Uh, you hope and send it back, although occasionally a cow will munch one up, which is generally not good for either the cow or the radio son. Um, and these um, are also done aboard ship. This is a Coast Guard cutter, and it's using a, pi a red pilot balloon, and it will track it with this theodolite here to also determine um, what the situation is at the upper levels. And then all of that information was um, fed in. Um, to upper level charts so that um, steering, steering currents could be identified. But all of that was expensive. All of that was expensive. So you can see that there were only a handful of kite and balloon stations in the US um, before the war, OK, basically. And so um, 
huge parts of the US West had absolutely no upper air information. It was pretty much all concentrated in the East. And then around the world, there were really only a handful of these sites, but they held down um, the upper level um, situation so that um, weather forecasters could figure out what was going on. And then um, later on, we had the invention of these. These are drop songs, and these are like radio songs in reverse. They are dropped from planes down through hurricanes. And so there's the, the uh, parachute that keeps it kind of uh, going in the right direction. And of course, they're very heavy so that they just fall straight through. And this is the drop song pattern from Hurricane Gilbert. So you can see they were flying back and forth um, um, across the hurricane eye wall and, um, and the feeder bands. And then they were able to determine the wind speed and direction there. And although not field instruments, I do want to talk about radar for a minute since radar was uh, sort of the first equipment remote sensing uh, that we had. So this dates from World War II when radar was not built for weather. Uh, but in 1943, these are the, some of the first images from uh, using radar for weather. And this was a cold front that was um, in the Boston area. And of course, now we have Doppler weather radar that looks like this, which is a lot more sophisticated than anything that we had back in 19. 43. But of all these instruments and observations, even those of the upper air, we're talking about field work, okay? So people are going outside, they're making observations based on their experience and knowledge. They're recording data according to international standards, sharing all of the data points um, with data cent processing centers around the world. And while weather observers are measuring the atmosphere, geologists, geographers, oceanographers, ecologists, field biologists, both land and marine, among others, are also out in the field collecting samples, making sketches, taking photographs, and using specialized instruments and tools to move their knowledge of the Earth forward. But at some point, they take their samples back to a laboratory for analysis to determine the nature of what they've found and to see what connections they can make to the field work of others around the world. But what exactly is a laboratory for a meteorologist if it's not outside? So yes, there are meteorologists who have done work with wind tunnels, uh, which allow them to replicate surface air motion over and over and over again um, with varying um, wind speeds and, and directions, which they don't have the choice to do um, in, the, in nature. And we do have atmospheric chemists, um, and they also are lab-based. But for the most part, meteorology labs are computer labs, and they run on data, lots and lots of data, provided by eyes on the ground, looking up to the sky to assess cloud cover and ceiling height, looking horizontally to determine visibility, peering at thermometers housed in thermo screens, checking readouts of wind direction and speed, and reading and emptying rain gauges. Now, considering how much land and water cover the Earth, we really don't have that many weather observing stations. Uh, they are expensive to install, expensive to maintain, and there's not enough funding to have weather stations in uninhabited areas. And that's where satellites come in. These eyes in the sky look down and see cohesive patterns from above that we will never see from below. Their increasingly sophisticated sensors can record many types of data that allow meteorologists to make better forecasts and to untangle the atmosphere's complexity. And so in this image, you can see here that in 1940, there were only 334 total upper air stations. All right, so that's not a whole lot. You can see there were big parts that, that weren't uh, really covered at all. And then it increases over time by 1965, we're here. Um, 1990, we're here. And we've actually lost some in the last few years down to 978 in 2015. But there's still large amounts of the earth. And of course, all of this water area where you only get an occasional report from ships that are upper air um, uh, equipped. So 
if we look at satellites, we have two different kinds. Basically, we have polar orbiters, which fly about 250 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And because the Earth is turning underneath it, that means it goes over the same location twice a day. It, they collect data on precipitation, sea surface temperature, atmospheric temperature and humidity, sea ice extent, forest fires, um, volcanic eruptions, global vegetation, and they can be used in search and rescue efforts as well. The geostationary satellites, which are the ones that provide the images that most of us see on a daily basis, are out here at about the 36,000 kilometer point, and um, they fly uh, so that they stay in, in relation to the same point on the equator, and they see um, the full disk of the Earth when they're doing that. Now, the geostationary satellites uh, help monitor and predict weather and environmental events, including tropical systems, tornadoes, flash floods, dust storms, volcanic eruptions, and forest fires. Those film loops you pull up on the internet, those are all from geostationary satellites whose frequent pictures of the Earth Earth's surface permit meteorologists to track large scale systems and anticipate their intensification or eventual demise. All right, so just so that you can see some samples of things that you might not normally see, um, this was an infrared image from 1982. So it's dependent um, upon uh, the sun shining um, off of these, these clouds here, and not always, it's really based on temperature. And so these are really high clouds because they're bright and the lower clouds um, are warmer. And so they come out as these gray clouds underneath. So this is all low level stuff around Florida. And then these are these high level clouds around the outside edges. Because we're technically in Barcelona today, this was a nice image um, from Tyros N in the 1980s of the Iberian Peninsula. This is a water vapor image, which gives uh, meteorologists an indication of um, the possibility of precipitation events and how much moisture they might expect to arrive. This is a, a lovely image that shows dust that's blowing off of um, the African continent that now very clearly shows up there. This, these are plankton blooms. All these eddies are plankton blooms in the Baltic Sea. Not exactly a meteorology uh, application, but it works nonetheless. This is a volcanic eruption in Chile from 2015. Um, the uh, sensors, not the ones that take the pictures, but the other sensors send back information on sea surface temperatures. And so that data goes into these sea surface, uh, sea surface temperature anomaly charts that show uh, where the um, Water temperature is higher or lower than normal. This is a nice snow cover extent map from 2010. Um, this is smoke from wildfire in, fire in California. We had even worse ones last year. So um, uh, all of this smoke could be tracked um, for many, many kilometers further on down the line. And some of these satellites can also be used for search and rescue. So the distress call goes up and then they're able to figure out where they are and then the happy little helicopter comes in and rescues them. So a lot more purposes than the original plan for these satellites. So where do weather satellites fit into all of this? Are their eyes in the sky part of meteorology the field science? or are they big data producers for meteorology, the laboratory science? I think the answer to that question is that they inhabit the border territory between operational weather forecasting and research meteorology, a border that has sometimes been sturdy and seemingly impenetrable, only to become fuzzier and more flexible with time as transitions from research to operations builds bridges instead of walls. So let's back up a bit and see where meteorology was before World War II broke out. While in many European countries, meteorologists for national weather services moved back and forth between operational forecasting, that is field meteorology, and research meteorology in the lab, this was not the case in the United States. 
where almost all meteorology took place at the US Weather Bureau, and the research opportunities were very few. Most meteorologists worked in far-flung weather stations, not at Weather Bureau headquarters in Washington, DC, that happens to be where this picture is, where the few research efforts took place. And in the days before numerical weather prediction provided the basic conceptual tool of weather forecasters, the synoptic weather map that they were busy analyzing the last drop of weather data and extrapolating the positions of low pressure centers and their associated frontal systems across their forecasting areas so that they could get out a forecast for the next 24 to 36 to 48 hours. Weather Bureau meteorologists tended to remain in the same forecast area for many years for a reason. They needed not only a feeling for the atmosphere, that is the ability to carry a three-dimensional image of the atmosphere around in their heads, they needed to have lived in one place long enough to understand the microclimatic circumstances of their forecast area embedded in regional and continental atmospheric contexts. How did the mountain range in the middle of their area affect precipitation? Under what conditions could they expect a low pressure area to explosively deepen? How would local farmers be affected if high pressure lingered too long? Were conditions setting up for dense early morning fog that would shut down transportation routes? Such knowledge is hard won and cannot easily be passed down to a new arrival to the station despite the notebook full of local forecasting thumb rules. Time on site made a huge difference in a forecaster's effectiveness. But after World War II, the circumstances slowly started to change. Over 6,000 men in the United States received advanced education and training in meteorology as a result of the war. While most did not remain in the field, some of those who did returned for doctorates and became world leaders in atmospheric research, particularly in the new world of numerical weather prediction, where having a feeling for the atmosphere was not only no longer a requirement, but was considered to be relatively quaint. On the other hand, those still in the forecasting trenches, some of whom had been taught the theoretical parts of meteorology during the war, were astonished when they turned into disciplinary leaders. Or as an operational meteorologist told me once, referring to a prominent modeling pioneer, he was really a mathematician. He couldn't analyze a weather map, much less write a forecast. I was shocked to find out that he was so important in numerical weather prediction. And thus the gap that separated the meteorology field science from meteorology lab science was born. As numerical weather prediction techniques were rolled out to operational forecasters in the late 1950s, field forecasters were unimpressed and quite frankly, rightfully so. Early models were extremely primitive. Yes, the resulting weather maps looked meteorological. There weren't bullseyes somewhere on the page, nor were there just parallel lines stretching from left to right across the continent. But a replacement for the hand-drawn charts? Absolutely not. Indeed, the verification of these computer-generated maps, many of which were wadded up by forecasters and thrown in the trash, were based on hand-drawn charts that were broadcast to field offices on the same transmission link. Let's just say they were not ready for prime time. How would the modelers get the forecasters to accept the new charts? The answer, stop sending the hand-analyzed charts. Once that decision was made, field forecasters flooded the modelers with feedback on how to improve the product. And they were able to deliver by tweaking the models improving data input and having access to increasingly powerful computers. Were the models ideal? No. Field offices still real analyzed the weather maps, but they could start with the computer plotted and analyzed charts and work from there. What forecasters still needed was the feeling for the atmosphere that supplemented the field data the models needed to produce the weather maps. And that feeling could not be incorporated into mathematical code. Over time, improving computing capacity allowed for tighter grid spacing in the models and the addition of more atmospheric variables beyond the temperature and pressure inputs to the earliest models. 
although moisture, a major player in atmospheric processes, was not included until the 1990s, along with improved modeling of related physical processes. Numerical weather prediction models always depend on available data to set initial conditions and computing power. With each new generation of computers, numerical forecasts improve, forecasters learn the strengths and weaknesses of the models for their particular spot on the planets and make their forecasts accordingly. At the same time that numerical weather prediction was getting ready to take off in the 1950s, so too was another technology, artificial satellites to be placed in Earth orbit. Improvements in rocketry during the war had already led to the first high altitude pictures of clouds in the late 1940s. But sending up rockets and retrieving film canisters was an expensive and impractical way to get pictures of clouds and certainly was never going to assist operational forecasters. Simultaneously, the multidisciplinary think tank, the RAND Corporation, was under contract to the US military, providing advice on national security issues and had started working on the potential for artificial Earth satellites. One of its employees was meteorologist William Kellogg, who had served with the Air Weather Service as a weather reconnaissance pilot. He realized that such satellites could be an ideal platform for carrying weather sensors. And with colleague Stanley Greenfield, wrote a report about such a possibility and sent it to the US Air Force in April 1951. The Air Force promptly classified the report as secret and it disappeared. But the idea, of course, did not. The Weather Bureau's Chief of Scientific Services, Harry Wexler, who combined both field and research meteorology, was also a major proponent of weather satellites. In 1954, Wexler wrote, a satellite vehicle would be of inestimable value as a weather patrol for short rain forecasting and as a collector of basic research information for long-term weather changes and climatic variations. Note here that Wexler's vision of a weather satellite includes both field and research elements. As a weather patrol agent, it is providing an additional set of eyes for the operational forecaster who needs the information right away. And as a long-term data collection platform, it is providing information for the research community that does not need to worry about data being perishable. Wexler continued to push this vision until his death in 1962. And as planning for the International Geophysical Year got underway, it included the launching of an artificial satellite into Earth orbit, which of course came to fruition with the Soviet Union's launching of Sputnik 1 in 1957. The initial plan for weather satellites was to provide images of Earth's surface using space as the perch from which to take a field observation of cloud patterns that could not be observed from the ground. The first experimental weather satellite, Tyros-1, was launched into near polar orbit on 1 April 1960. It transmitted its first picture of clouds soon after, and President Eisenhower had the photo in his hands five hours later. I think they had to expedite that to make that happen. The satellite's camera only worked for 78 days, but during that time, it snapped and transmitted almost 23,000 pictures of Earth and the cloud patterns that formed and disappeared above its surface. Within days, Weather Bureau and military forecasters were using them, but they were not useful without significant post-processing of the images. And here, you can see that we have um, the original shots up here. It's all a mosaic. So they had, to, they had to tape them, literally tape them together, cut them and tape them together. And then they uh, rectified them and um, put in the surface analysis um, around them so that people could see how they could be used. But it took a lot of work to get from here to here. Unlike today's geostationary satellites, whose pictures form the film loops we are accustomed to seeing on the news and online just a short time after they are taken, these early images had to be rectified to deal with geographic distortion and assembled into mosaics so they were close to useless. 
Indeed, they were typically used by forecasters to watch data sparse, sparse tropical areas to spot tropical storms, which could then be added to weather maps by hand, estimating their intensity and most likely path due to atmospheric forcing and allowing necessary warnings to ships and inhabited areas that might be in danger. But for most forecasting scenarios, they were not terribly useful because even if operational forecasters could receive the grainy images, they likely only got one useful image that, and that was not terribly easy to interpret. Following the success of Tyros I, and with lobbying from Weather Bureau Chief Francis Reicheldurfer, Congress allotted financial support for a weather satellite system. Tyros II was launched in November 1960, and the next year, NASA and the Weather Bureau started to offer training sessions to meteorologists from 27 countries to use satellite photographs operationally. However, operational use was intermittent until 1965, this is a 1965 picture, when improved cameras and new orbits produced images of cloud patterns that covered the entire Earth. These innovations allowed operational meteorologists to see all storms at least once a day, making the satellite images relevant and useful on the forecasting floor. And you can see here that it's all just little pictures that have been pieced together to get this to work. But again, even into the 1970s, these images were of relatively poor quality compared to what we see now. And downlinks and geographical tags needed to locate the image did not always work. I was stationed at the US Navy's Fleet Weather Center in Rota, Spain in the mid 1970s. And some of the images that came in were beyond mysterious, looking like something akin to an ink blot test. And they came in to my office on this piece of equipment. We didn't know what we were looking at, nor what they meant. And if there were, was no grid underneath it, we didn't even know where in the world it was from. So just as it took a number of years before numerical weather prediction to be useful to forecasters, it took several years for operational meteorologists to be able to tie their way of looking at the atmosphere to the eye in the sky's way of looking at the atmosphere. The first geosynchronous satellite, ATS-1, went operational in 1966, providing continuous coverage of an area from Africa westward to the Pacific and from 70 north to 70 south with visible images, meaning you can only see them during daylight hours. Later versions of geosynchronous satellites added high resolution visible and infrared sensors, which took photographs every 20 minutes throughout the day and then were looped into short film strips. Now, not everybody had the capability of making film strips. So what we used to do in the weather offices where I worked was that we would just stack them up and then we would flip through the charts like those flip cartoon books we had as kids. Um, and that's how we got to see how the systems were moving um, uh, through, through time. Not optimum, but at least it worked. These became very useful to forecasters who could use them to track storm systems. And as the resolution improved, they were able to predict local severe weather, which was very helpful. By the late 1960s, the World Meteorological Organization had set up both operational and research programs to exploit the global uses of weather satellite imagery. The World Weather Watch, established in 1968, set up a global weather forecasting program based on data from both polar orbiting and geostationary weather satellites. Images for forecasters and data to be fed into numerical weather prediction models, thus filling in the holes where there were no observing stations. And this was taking place during the height of the Cold War. And so not long after the hotline had been put in um, between the US and the Soviet Union, um, they started discussing this possibility. It didn't come to fruition for another several years, but that connection was known as the cold line instead of the hotline. In 1969, the extensive Global Atmospheric Research Program called GARP and the first global 
GARP global experiment called FIGI uh, were co-sponsored by the International Council of Scientific Union. And so they simultaneously collected data from satellite and land and ocean-based platforms, which resulted in new insights in the global atmospheric circulation and improved models. If we look here, we have, of course, they wouldn't have all looked like this. This is strictly an artist's conception, but we have all of these satellites uh, that are beaming information down. We have very large balloons that are taking up payloads with sensors and would just um, move within the wind patterns. We were getting uh, data from aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, we had uh, centers on the ground that were beaming things in. We had buoys that were beaming information and we had sensors that were on ships. This is one that's just sent up a balloon. So it was a massive project that included many, many countries and um, many hundreds of uh, personnel to gather all of these data from the surface of the earth all the way up into the high atmosphere so that we could see everything that was going on between these layers, which was a huge boon for the modelers and for researchers who were trying to figure out ocean circulation, um, and atmospheric and ocean circulation for that matter. So over time, more sophisticated computers and additional remote sensors changed the roles of satellites from the space-based observers uh, sp who snapped pictures and sent them back to forecast forecasters to interpret in light of Earth-based observational data. So we have the pictures from above and the observations from below meeting. And now that switches so that we include the data collection piece of this. So the satellites had become data collection machines that gathered massive amounts of data that could be fed into numerical weather prediction models. Now, because the quality of the numerical output depended on the initial conditions, that is the data that were fed into it, the idea was that carefully crafted sensors on satellites would be able to provide data in data sparse regions, such as oceans and in uninhabited land areas. But it would take a number of years to create and test those sensors, right? Because you can't just put them up there, you have to ground truth them. So in the meantime, researchers tried to quantitatively interpret the images, just the pictures, to determine, for example, wind speed and direction based on cloud motion between pictures, or to determine that it was calm on the ocean surface because there was a sun glint, because if you had sun glint, that meant you didn't have choppy water at the surface. They also were able to determine estimates of surface and upper air pressure based on cloud signatures and humidity from estimates of moisture based on cloud types in the images. While better than nothing, these values did not always provide a better model run. Indeed, in 1977, then the U.S. National Meteorological Center determined that satellite data were no better than data they could get in other ways because the models did not have sufficient resolution to use them. The data slipped through the grid spacing just like small fish slip out of fishing nets. By the late 1980s, sensors that could take remote soundings of temperature, pressure, and humidity just as radio sons collect the same information as they float upwards and drop sons as they drop to the surface. Um, those had been created, they tested against radio son, they tested the results against radio son data and then installed them on both polar, polar orbiters and geostationary satellites. Even then, the data required significant post-processing to account for cloud cover that could skew the results. These quantitative data were then fed into numerical models, which now had smaller grid spacing due to increased computing power. So you need all of these pieces at the same time. While it might seem that more data would always produce better model output, that is not the case. The usefulness of the model output depends on its ability to assimilate the data and that varies from model to model. So what is the takeaway here? As with the introduction of most new techniques to the sciences, field or laboratory, full adoption and use in practical settings often lags behind research and development. 
In meteorology, forecasters were quick to accept reports from arriving pilots about the weather they had observed en route and then use it during flight briefings of pilots heading back the same direction because they trusted the pilots to provide them with valid data. And they used that to keep departing pilots safe. When they found that Radiosan data were also consistently reliable and useful in their forecasting routines, then they used those. Similarly, numerical weather prediction was not quickly adopted by operational meteorologists because the computer models could produce weather model maps that were equal to what they could produce by hand with their own knowledge about and feeling for the atmosphere in the forecast area. Research meteorologists working in computer laboratories that now represented meteorological laboratories would never be on the receiving end of irate phone calls from people complaining about two feet of partly cloudy stacked up on their porch and eagerly explored atmospheric processes with their new modeling tools. Their concerns were not that the model presented the atmosphere as it existed outside their window, but that it was internally consistent. Even in the late 1980s, while I was a faculty member in the meteorology department at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, I remember commenting to our numerical weather prediction expert that the model was a bust. It showed massive high pressure over our area and it was pouring rain. I mean, not a little mist, it was pouring rain. Clearly something was wrong. After flipping through the wall of charts, he turned to me and said, it was a great model run. Look how consistent it is through all the layers. When I muttered that high pressure and high rain don't go together, he shook his head and said, oh, I never look outside. That's just a distraction. It was then crystal clear to me that we were operating in very different parts of meteorology and that his meteorology was not a field science. Weather satellite data, which was and is heavily dependent on computing power to produce usable products for forecasters, just like numerical model output was not immediately folded into daily use by field meteorologists who eventually came to consider that the eyes in the sky were the same as eyes on the ground, just located in a different place. As historian John Krieger has written, operational users look upon new methods with suspicion unless they are simple, reliable, inexpensive for them to use, and compatible with both their existing knowledge and familiar practices. This is particularly true in meteorology because operational forecasters work under intense time pressure. They must make decisions to warn their users based on the data they have and trust as quickly as possible. If severe weather is bearing down on their forecast area, they do not have the luxury of waiting for late data, another model run, or in the early days of satellite imagery, waiting until the next day to see what the satellite image showed. On the other hand, research meteorologists in computer labs were delighted to see these new data sources that could provide them new insight into how the atmosphere worked and developed ways to make best use of images not to forecast the weather, but to der derive information about data sparse areas that they could then fold into their models. For them, late data were still usable data that could be combined and used in multiple different ways in multiple different virtual experiments that did not need to give an accurate representation of the atmosphere during the first, 10th, or 100th model run. Numerical weather modeling and satellite data sit in the fuzzy borderland between field and research meteorology. While the techniques offer much to operational meteorologists in the field, they are developed in computer spaces that constitute the laboratory for most research meteorologists. The field scientists are able to move within the fuzzy boundary when the new techniques and new data can be incorporated into and add value to their daily practice and with encouragement, they can provide feedback to the researchers on the other side to improve the efficacy of their products. Does that mean we can stop doing surface observations? Not a chance, at least not yet, as a recent story in the New York Times about Icelandic observer Vila Elansdottir made clear. She makes observations every three hours, 24 seven, 
and sends them to the Icelandic Meteorological Office in Reykjavik. There is still no substitute for eyes on the ground looking up. Oops. And when not even that is enough, in the United States, we have the famous field scientist groundhog Poxitani Phil, who yesterday forecasted six more weeks of winter, and he did it without any satellite data at all. And now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christine, for this stimulating uh, talk, including this animal predictor <laughs> at the end. <laughs> um, now, Sebastian, uh, do you want to tell some words before opening the discussion, please? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, thanks for inviting me to comment on um, on this great talk. Thanks a lot, Christine, for your lovely talk. And um, I just would like to ask a few questions or get discussions going um, with uh, by kind of trying to get the um, a visual perspective on meteorology. So that's what I specialized in. So, and that's what I looked at uh, for my PhD thesis and my book and so on. So the, um, my questions will be around uh, the visual dimensions you were talking about. And um, as you've shown satellites, if we're discussing field and lab science, uh, satellites are the sort of go between us. They inhabit the border zone between the field and the laboratory. And so therefore they deserve indeed our close attention when we try to think about the field sciences and the uh, lab sciences. Now, as you have shown in your talk, the different types of images that circulated within that border zone are the actual training material, one could say, to help get the different communities um, involved to talk to each other. And um, so, for instance, there you, sh you have shown them, there were the TV images Tyrus produced. Uh, and uh, maybe one should mention that um, um, Tyrus didn't produce photographs, Tyrus produced indeed TV images with a, with a Vidicon camera, and that was a TV system. And uh, the Vidicon translates sort of luminosity into electrical current, and then you can send that signal back to Earth with a uh, radio, radio back that back to the station, uh, ground station. So and those each image is composed of 500 lines. And so you get now you get an idea when when you get an image that is radioed back to Earth, and then it's it's shown on a TV screen and then it's photographed by a 35 mil camera. There are many translations involved. And that explains also why that it's a pretty crude image that you get. It explains the, the, uh, the aesthetical uh, the appearance of the actual image uh, very well. And it explains also why one says uh, Tyrus pho photographed cloud patterns, although he did not, of course. So, and these TV images, once photographed, and you've shown that as well, could be rearranged uh, to form mosaics. Um, we've seen very nice examples to get a larger perspective on the atmosphere. And then there were, of course, uh, models that produced computer generated maps that were verified with hand drawn charts, as you mentioned as well and so on. So there is, in other words, a whole chain of images involved. And not only that, there were also many image operations, of course, involved, such as geographical reference, you know, ground truthing, uh, geocoding, correcting of image distortions, uh, image assemblage, image layering, superpositioning, and so on. And of course, we must not forget the classic meteorological charts, of course. Uh, so within this um, new image universe, one could say, there seems to be also a new f workflow that is, uh, has to be organized. And you mentioned this by, uh, in your talk by saying, or by asking the question, how did modelers get forecasters to accept their computer charts? And you get, your answer that you gave was, well, they st simply stopped sending hand analyzed charts. So it seems to me, um, I, I, and please correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the true Tyrus revolution 
lies precisely here. In all of the sudden, there's not just weather data at the beginning of the analytical process, but satellite images. And but if you have images, it's very hard to learn how to translate them into useful information uh, that, that can be integrated into a different numerical and analytical processes. So, uh, in other words, um, this th we have a new um, visual regime or scopic regime that requires a whole new set of techniques that that allow to exploit uh, the image and a lot of experience to know what one can actually see in these images. So uh, that's why one can speak of a new scopic regime, I think so. And that's why it's easy also to connect these images with the very early uh, history of balloons and uh, photography. They found together in the middle of the 19th century. And we have very similar discussions about this new view from above on the Earth, and where one has to think about this new image space that is really fundamentally new and something completely different and looking from the, with your feet on the ground. And uh, so that, that's, I think, it's worthwhile thinking about, um, also about this uh, longer history, of course, and you show that also, you mentioned that, of course, at the beginning of your talk. So uh, I think it's always worthwhile connecting uh, it to the early um, efforts in the 19th century. And uh, that explains also maybe, um, coming back to Tyrus, uh, why some historians give only little credit to the early Tyrus program. Uh, in terms of its actual impact on meteorology. So for many historians, Tyrus was great as a storm patrol. That's what Harry Wexler called it. And, um, and, and Tyrus, Tyrus, uh, Tyrus III, for example, um, did allow, uh, was the first satellite that allowed to identify a, um, a hurricane solidly with images. So, um, that worked really well. Nonetheless, the integration of the Tyrus uh, images into existing data pra practices was very time consuming, uh, very time intensive. Uh, so, and, also, and that's why very limited. Uh, so, so meteorology as a data driven science was not immediately ready for, for this iconic turn. Uh, if uh, if I could, uh, if one can call it like that, and it, and it would be very interesting to have your um, your point of view on this. And so maybe, and that's one. If you think further now, uh, maybe the of if you think about the impact and uh, the importance of the first weather sa satellites, uh, maybe their actual importance isn't really in meteorology, but maybe it's it's outside in the public sphere because these images, of course, they were shown on TV screen. Households were getting um, now um, massively TV sets sitting down in the evening and watching the weather news. And so and there you could get Tyrus images. And so maybe it's that is actually the actual legacy of Tyrus. That means uh, we it's more a symbolic and imaginary uh, setting because it allows placing a new, entirely new view on the Earth into a new context. And uh, th this, uh, I think, uh, and especially during hurricane season, of course. And so I believe that there, uh, the, 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 the actual value of Tyrus is probably, if it's not so important in meteorology immediately, except of the storm patrol function, maybe it's this imaginary function of placing the atmosphere and the view from above on the, of the atmosphere into the public sphere in a, in a broad or in a broader societal context. And uh, now to relate it to the visual dimension uh, is uh, and the use of images. Um, I would also like to ask a last question on, on the atlases because uh, well, in, we know, of course, from uh, Dastan, Lauren Dastan and Peter Gallison from the history of objectivity of, about the importance of atlases uh, in instructing, in teaching, in, uh, in the informing people uh, and get to know the discipline and how it, uh, how it functions and so on. And, and of course, the importance of the images within the atlases and the, the standardization of these images and the role of the persons of the scientist, what, how, what he can do, what he's allowed to do and what he's not allowed to do and so on. And 
Um, now, the, the cloud atlases, I would like, I wonder what happened to cloud atlases with Tyrus and what happened uh, and the rest, the, uh, and what uh, with the satellite revolution in general. Uh, I know I, I've seen the Tyrus Atlas, uh, but it's only the, um, uh, uh, for instance, the first Tyrus Atlas. It's it's just the the images that were 35 mil pictures taken from the TV screen, and one after another with the metadata. You can it's included in, but that's it. And I wonder what happened to this new to the what kind of new typology was introduced what kind of new of um what i i believe one had to, to invent a whole new set of um vocabulary uh, uh visual language to um also to train meteorologists afterwards and what happened to atlases so that will be uh, my second uh, or third i'm not sure how many questions i'm asking really but that will be um, another uh, uh, dimension to explore and um yeah of course it will remember you of course of harry wexler who had uh, who was who commissioned a, a, a painter to use um uh to imagine um uh, to imagine a perspective on the atmosphere from above what a satellite would give us to view but he had to imagine that of course he, he we had we had the first v2 and aero b photo photographs of the atmosphere from above so one could imagine some cloud pattern what it would look like some meteorological systems but it would one still had to it was still in, in a complete imagination and of course it's what not just an imagination but it was all condensed in one image and so a condensed cloud at last in one image so to speak and it was uh, as a matter of i've um, I've got it actually hanging here in my office because it was included in the IGY and the International Geophysical Year uh, promotional posters. They included his image in the one on the on the uh, water cycle and climate and meteorology, uh, weather and climate. It's called the poster, and in the middle you've got yeah. uh, uh, the Vexler image. And so, yeah, that's um, that's I, I, maybe you could uh, say uh, tell us something about the atlases as well and the whole new language that had to be invented maybe so uh thanks yeah thanks a lot for <laughs> your talk and thank you um for letting me comment on this uh, thanks Gemma, also for organizing this great uh, conference cycle okay thanks sebastian okay well so i made some notes while you were you were talking um so so I think from the from the Tyros side, it's um, it's not that they weren't totally that they were totally useless because they weren't, but certainly that that they that they couldn't arrive in a timely enough manner for people to use them for forecasting. So so essentially they were used as a after the fact kind of thing. You know, if they actually got a good picture, and there weren't that many people who were who were getting pictures, so it was a little bit different situation than with numerical weather prediction, where where all of the maps were coming in um, by specialized facsimile machines that, for people that don't know, aren't anything like a fax machine now, but were specially treated paper with um, and and a. a electrical signal that went back and forth and burned this damp paper and then gave you a chart when you were done. And that's how everybody got their weather maps was, was that way. And the ones that they sent out by a flatbed scanner were ones that had been hand drawn by um, at special centers. And then they also were sending out the numerical weather prediction maps, which everybody wadded up and threw away because they weren't as good as the ones that were hand drawn. And then finally, they just stopped sending the ones that were hand drawn and people were left with those. And then they had to deal with it and provide information so the models got better. When you're looking at satellite pictures, this is a definite, definite add on to what they had. So now, as you made clear, you have to be able to tie in this new picture to the way you already envision the atmosphere. And for these people, many of them, I'm not one of these people, okay, even though I worked in operational meteorology, I'm not one of these people, actually could envision in their mind how all of this stuff was fitting together in a three-dimensional pattern. And so for those people, they're not only looking at the map, which is a 2D vision of what they've got, 
and the other layers of maps to give them the 3D vision. Now they've got this satellite picture and they're trying to fit that, they're trying to fit it in. They're not likely to get it soon enough to fit it in to make the next forecast. But my guess is over time, for the people who were getting these, what they were doing is that they were looking after the fact to see what they could have done with it if they had gotten it on time, because they couldn't have spent the time at the time to figure out what was going on. So it had to be a situation where over time, they were looking at the satellite pictures and comparing those to what they'd already figured out so that in the future, when they got a picture that was on time, they could say, oh, we've seen this signature before. Likely at stations, they kept their own little supply of these. I mean, certainly they did where I worked, right? If, if, in a, if in a very interesting picture came in that was, a, that was set up as a meteorological situation we didn't see very often, we saved it. <laughs> so that the next time it popped up, somebody could say, you know, we've seen that pattern before. <laughs> um, let's see what the rest of the information shows us so that we can take advantage of that. This is really true in the Mediterranean where, so I was stationed at the Rota office and we were forecasting for the Mediterranean and there would be low pressure centers that would form just south of the Atlas Mountains um, on the northern part of Africa and Morocco. And then they'd sneak around the side, they'd come into the Mediterranean and they would um, explosively develop. The models never picked those up, ever. And so consequently, we had to look for other clues. And sometimes you got a clue from a satellite picture if it came in at the right time. And the people who were used to that would say, hey, give me that satellite picture again. <laughs> and then they'd look at the satellite picture, they'd look at the model run, which of course showed nothing. And then they'd say, we need, we need to be watching this really careful, carefully, right? And they had certain stations then that they would watch to see if there was a, a pressure change or something that they weren't expecting. And then they'd be able to put the warning out soon enough so that people didn't get beat up in the Mediterranean. So I think that's what was going on with much of this Tyro stuff to begin with, is that it was being used basically after the fact until people got used to the fact that they could count on it and they could use it and they could tie it in with their models. And then they were able to make better forecasts with it. I do think, of course, that it, that it attracted the imagination of the general public. I mean, I was... I was about um, I was about ten when these when we first started getting really good tyro shots in the early '60s, and I thought it was like the coolest thing ever um, to be able to see these to see these cloud shots. And remember, this is the time of the Cold War, and so if we had something that we didn't think the Russians had, then that was always a totally cool thing too. So you had this other kinds of political geopolitical situation that was really built into this into this system. Were we going to share our pictures with the Russians? If the Russians had pictures, were they going to share them with us? Right? And that's why it takes all of the 60s to develop this World Weather Watch thing where we're all promising to share our pictures with each other in real time instead of holding them back, thinking that we've got an advantage over somebody else. Um, Onto the, um, and, so, and so how were they using? The other thing I wanted to mention was even if they weren't using them in quite the way that we use them now, uh, particularly for tropical systems, the Dvorak analysis was critical. And that was dependent upon looking at hundreds and hundreds of these images and being able to track how hurricanes changed um, how, their, how the image of the hurricane changed over time so that they could tell whether, uh, uh, um, what the size of the eye wall was, whether the size of the eye, what the size of the eye was, whether it was murky in the middle, whether it was clear in the middle, how the, how the feeder bands looked. And of course, Dvorak made this whole like little mini atlas of hand-drawn uh, images. And I still was teaching students that in the 80s. Right, that you know, if you're out there and you've got to, if you're doing uh, hurricane forecasting someplace, then you're going to check your satellite picture against this Dvorak model, and you're going to see what matches, and then you're going to start from that point with your forecast, and that was really, really important in um, starting in the '60s, and was we were still, I was still teaching it in the '80s. I don't know what they do now. Um, 
maybe less of it, but my guess is that they still they still use it quite a bit because you're you're not going to be out there in the middle of the hurricane finding out what's going on. I mean, you just you don't have you don't have that capability. Um, on cloud atlases, um, actually, I still used cloud atlases when I was doing it. What they were doing more than looking at individual images was learning how to represent the satellite pictures on a map with what we called a NEF analysis. And with a NEF analysis, particularly when you were doing flight forecasting, and those were the people that were really interested in the upper levels, right, were the pilots, is that you had your chart and then you drew in on the satellite picture the clouds that were there. So they'd know where the clouds were and what their levels were. So that was known as a NEF analysis. And so when they were briefing out pilots, they didn't brief out pilots with satellite pictures. They briefed them out with the NEF analysis that was on their map that they were going to use that showed where they could anticipate cloud cover and what type and where they needed not to go. Particularly if we're talking about um, thunderstorms, flying through a thunderstorm ruins your whole day, right? Because you're now wingless on your plane and that's never a good thing. So, so we would mark areas you know, where there would be um, particularly uh, great vertical development. And we could see that from the satellite picture, but we didn't stand there and explain that to a pilot. We gave the pilot the NEF analysis. So it was something we used and then we translated for other people to use. I don't know that I ever saw an atlas of satellite pictures. When you said that, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I never saw that in an operational site. We still used regular cloud atlases. Um, we used we used analysis tools um, uh, for how to do NEF analysis, and everybody knew how to do that. Um, but actual images, unless we'd saved them ourselves because it was something peculiar that we hadn't seen before, I don't recall seeing that. But that's an that's an interesting yeah that would have been an interesting thing yeah. Did I answer all your questions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a okay. lot. <laughs> So um, thanks, Sebastian and, and Christine. Um, does anybody in the room uh, want to address some questions or comments uh, or thoughts? Changli? <laughs> I have some thoughts, so I, I can I can go ahead if you want. <laughs> Please go ahead. I shared okay. I, I shared a, a a question that I have already with uh, Christine. And uh, I'm I'm really anxious to uh, to to know her answer. But please go ahead first. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I also shared my question with her. So, but it's also <laughs> somehow related to this uh, utility of, of of satellite data, but seen from another approach. Um, um, uh, so what uh, what is the role of modelers um, in, in influencing technological changes uh, at NASA. For, um, so let me uh, uh, share. Um, so uh, this connects with the blurring, uh, this lack of field boundaries um, that you describe, um, because um, uh, 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 that is expressed in the type of users and therefore the type of users of this data. So for instance, uh, first Tyros data were pictures, right? Or TV um, images, as uh, right. Sebastian uh, pointed out. Um, but uh, they were useful to either identify or classify the clouds in this classical taxonomic um, line of some of the field sciences, but not based on physical measurements or sounding of these atmospheric parameters that are useful uh, to modelers. Um, but from the, um, let's say, 70s onwards, uh, these TV cameras uh, were progressively replaced by spectrometers or radiometers, mm -hmm. um, who, um, uh, which measure uh, these physical variables uh, and which satisfied modelers' need for more data. Um, uh, so uh, to what extent this modelers community somehow influenced this technological change at NASA, or was it just a techno part of this NASA's technological innovation mandate? So this is okay. Well, that's a very good question. Um, 
certainly NASA, NASA basically switched heavily into um, earth science-y kinds of things when it appeared that their space program may be taking a hit, right? And they needed to stay, they needed to stay in business. And so if you need to stay in business and, and you're looking at your main business going away, then you start looking down instead of looking up. So, so at that point, NASA becomes more uh, heavily involved uh, with working with the various iterations of the weather people now known as, known as NOAA. And, and at the same time, we're looking at models basically that can only be improved with increasing computer power. So computer power was always the bottom line issue for the modelers. How many, um, how, you know, how, how much memory space did you have? What, what could you compute? How could you make the grid spacing smaller and all those kinds of things? And at first, they were still only using the basic information that they could get for the upper air from radio sons. So temperature, pressure, and relative humidity. They wanted more of that because as I showed in the little chart, those stations were spread all over the place. And for big hunks of the world, they had absolutely nothing. So I would say initially, the big move from the modelers was to get that sounding data. So they would have wanted, they would have said, hey, if you, can, if you can figure out a way so that you can get sounding data from the satellite so that we can get temperature pressure and relative humidity data throughout the atmosphere all over the world, then we'll be able to feed that in, particularly for the, for the upper layers of the atmosphere when they're doing those runs. So there's no question in my mind that they would have been interested in that. The later things that happened wouldn't have been so much for operational models as for their research models, because there just wasn't enough. I mean, by the 1990s, we're still, we still have not introduced good physics and moisture into the models, which they've been able to get for a while. I mean, we had the physics all along, right? We just didn't have computing power that was able to handle it. But they have been able to get and they had been able to get moisture information, right? That's the relative humidity stuff. They could have gotten that moisture information, but that wasn't until the 1990s either. Why? Because you didn't have enough computing power. So what they would have been doing, my guess, is they would have said, great, if you can get us this other information, that's fine. We're not going to use it for our operational models. We're going to use those for our theory-based models. What can they tell us about the atmosphere not what we're trying to tell people in 24 hours or 36 hours or 48 hours, but what does it tell us theoretically about what the atmosphere is doing? And if you can, and if you're sending it up anyway, and you can figure out how to do it and you can hang it on there, yeah, let's do it. Um, and so there would have definitely been in, encouragement from that. And they would have, you know, if you're sending something up, you're always happy to send up as many little bells and whistles things as you can. On, on one machine and that it wouldn't have taken a whole lot of um, motivation, I don't think, to have, to have put those on. But, but I don't think it was for the operational side initially. I think it was for the research side because they could do that in small, in small batches, not in the whole global batch. Does okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, so one is from Giuseppe Simon. He says, thank you very much. A little question. Is the weather forecast field local, national, transnational, universal? <laughs> and, and uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, please. it's yeah. all of those things, okay? So weather forecasting is always local, right? Because the people who live there want to know if they can have a picnic this weekend or if they need to put coats on their kids in the morning and all those kinds of things. Um, it's national because it's almost always done on a national basis. In other words, most countries have their own national weather service of, of, some, of some kind. Then if you look at, at places like Europe where you have the European Center for Midrange Forecasting, ECMWF, that's a regional thing. Now they're doing, of course, 
international, they're, they're doing global forecasts, just like the US is doing global forecasts, just like the Russians are doing global forecasts. You know, people are doing global forecasts, but they join together as a consortium in a region focused on their region. And when I was stationed in Iceland as the, as the lead meteorologist there uh, in the early 1990s, I depended on European center models, which I got from my friends at the Icelandic Weather Office because I couldn't get them as a, as a, at the Navy office because the Navy wanted us to use Navy models. But the Navy models weren't real good for Iceland. So, but ECMWF was. And so I would, I would call my friends at the, at the Icelandic Weather Office and say, can you send us some maps? And they'd pop in over our little fax machine and then I'd have them to use. And then on a, on a, on a, on a around the world basis, certainly through the World Meteorological Organization and everybody, everybody has to cooperate in order to get their models to work in order to make a forecast. And if somebody holds back data, then that's a problem for everybody. I mean, right now it's a problem that we're not getting in all of these airplane observations because of course people aren't flying anyplace. I mean, it's not like you can say, well, you're withholding the data, it's just not available, but it has had an impact on the models. So I think it's all, I think it's all of those things and it's the cooperation between all of those groups that allows it to happen. Thanks, there are more questions, I read them. So Katie Duncan says, thanks for the great talk. Do you think that the problems of nuclear testing during the Cold War, oh, sorry, wait. So start again. Do you think that the problems of nuclear testing during the Cold War impacted the, the eyes on the sky and eyes on the ground in different ways? And how do you think it impacted the relationship between, the, between those in the lab and field? That's an interesting question. Thank you, Katie. Um, for the most part, I would say they had limited impact because most of the above ground testing happened before we had satellites. Um, so, so the big tests that were right after the war and in the early 50s, that was, that was all before we had, uh, we had satellite systems. Certainly what they, what they impacted on the ground was that people started um, uh, collecting and testing uh, rainwater samples for radiation. And then the, um, the folks who were modeling the atmospheric circulation, they were able to use that data and figure out what the flight patterns were of the, um, of the radioactive uh, materials that ended up in the, in the rain gauges and use that. I mean, clearly you wouldn't, you wouldn't launch a, a, nuclear, uh, a nuclear weapon even for a test just so a bunch of meteorologists could figure out you know, what the pattern was of the air moving. But I mean, since, since they were already doing it, they took advantage of that. And that certainly, that data certainly helped uh, the people who were trying to figure out how atmospheric um, circulation, circulation worked. And it was used by both the research community and the field community then. Still another one, Christopher Holm. Concerning the title of the talk, I have a short question, which relates to Christine's remarks that some meteorologists call the outside a distraction. I would like to know how the actors classified their own working spaces and the space of their research objects. Did they refer to them as a lab or as a field? Um, thanks, Christopher. Another interesting question. Um, I can say for the people who were modelers that I knew, so I mean, ac the academic folks, uh, not the Navy operational folks that I worked with, but, but the academic folks that I worked who were, who were new America weather prediction um, people, is, is their working space was in the virtual atmosphere that lived within their computer program. That's, that's literally where they lived. And their whole mission was to make sure that the model produced output that was, that was um, uh, stable and made sense from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. That's what they were, that's what they were looking for. Uh, they did not engage in forecasting. They were really not concerned about the weather at all. They were mostly concerned about how the atmospheric circulation 
worked and, and if their models were internally consistent. Um, I'm not sure that they saw that as a lab, really. Um, I've, I've thought about that since um, I was asked to participate in this, uh, in this uh, series of, of talks because they didn't talk about it as the lab. I mean, when, we, uh, when I was teaching graduate school, we had a lab, but the lab was full of maps hanging up all over the place and then people running outside to look to see what the weather was because they were all active duty military officers were all of the students. How, how he would have referred to it if he had been in a different academic situation. So one of the, um, you know, we were a research institution, but we were, it was a research institution that was supporting people who were in the field um, on active duty. And so, and so I, I think that might have changed his answer at that point. I think he would have he would have described then his working space as a lab, huh. but I but I don't think he would have described it as a field. Are there more questions? I've got another one. Yeah. David. Yeah. Well, Chenlin's got a question, but he he yes. needs to speak it so that Go people ahead. can hear what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let, let me rephrase, but uh, you had such a beautiful answer to uh, Sebastian's uh, uh, um, list of questions when you mentioned the system that was coming from the Atlas Mountains and then um, sort of invaded the Mediterranean and then uh, exploded. Now, yeah. what I'm saying is that this is a typical synopticist way of looking at, 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 at uh, weather patterns. And right. that you're basically seeing with, between um, air quotes um, uh, three dimensional uh, air masses uh, meeting each other. So there's a front there and, and, and so on. Um, but what I'm insisting on is that um, these patterns, this three, the, the, the very idea of a, of a distinct three dimensional air mass is a theoretical concept. And yet yeah. you, and yet you see it. Yes. And, and yes. I'm so um, uh, curious uh, how you do that and why it is that the modelers miss out on those. Yeah. So so I'm not actually one of those people that's really good with the whole three dimensional thing, um, as my a mechanical drawing teacher in high school used to tell me on a regular basis, um, which is why I'm not an engineer, right? And I'm something else. Um, but I, but I did work with people who could do that, and so they were they were people who knew about all the theory part, right? So they'd all been trained in air mass theory. They, you know, they could picture in their head what was happening if you had a cold front and what that wedge of air looked like, what it would look like if it was a warm front and what that looked like and if it was an occluded front, how those were all stacked up, which was always very confusing to students, thinking, trying to figure out where the air was at any given, any given time. And not everybody can do that. But there were a lot of meteorologists who could do it. Um, and it was fascinating to be with them because they were, from inside their heads, they had constructed the theory, could look at a surface map and an upper level map and picture the entire thing in their head and then say, okay, well, then clearly, and I always loved it when they'd say, well, clearly, because it wasn't clear to anybody else. Clearly, um, we're going to have, this is going to set up and then, you know, it, and the, and the, um, and, and got positive electricity advection aloft and, and the whole atmosphere is slanted, the energy system is slanted this way, and then it's going to come over, and this part's going to spin up, and boom, you know, it's going to be really nasty when George Bush is on this, on this uh, ship up of Malta uh, with Gorbachev, and everybody's going to be so seasick that they can hardly see straight, and yeah, well, I mean, like, that's what happened, and then our phones never quit ringing, you know, we stationed in Spain at the time, and and I'm getting a call from, from the fleet meteorologist who says, you know, it's really bad out here. I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we know that it's really bad. Like, I can't fix it. <laughs> you know, it's not <laughs> going to get fixed. 
it's not going to, I had, you know, like, like you can't control it. You can't control it. Nobody can control it. You know, your choice is to pull into port and be someplace where it's not bad, or you're just going to have to ride it out. Uh, he said, well, but they're really unhappy. And I said, you know, like, I'm sorry, I didn't produce it. We're just telling you that the situation we had people, you know, and I was the operations officer at the time. And the, the people I the forecasters I worked with knew what was going to happen. And they, I mean, they laid it out. They said, this is not a good idea for those people to be there. And, and we're looking at the maps. And of course, the computer models had totally missed it. And, they, and, and I said, well, you know, there's nothing in the models. And they said, well, we know there's never anything in the models. It's this situation and it's setting up. The models aren't going to miss it and they're going to get creamed. Um, explained the whole thing with air mass theory and they knew exactly where it was and they drew me little sketches and they tried to make them 3D and we put out our forecast and we were right. Um, but it, you know, it's not for everybody, but the, but the modelers, they're worried about the equation, which terms they can throw out, which ones they have to leave in, and then what shows up and is consistent all the way through. And if it doesn't happen to give you the weather forecast you want, oh well, that's the best they could do. Um, I mean, I can remember being horrified because I was the computer officer the first time I was in Spain in the 70s when we get when we get a message from the modeling group that said we have made small software changes that will be transparent that will that will be trans well that will not impact your operation. At which point I would get off the phone, I would walk out on the forecast floor and say, can you guys get ready to start plotting by hand because they're getting ready to change the model and they claim we won't be able to see the difference, but we all know that there's gonna be a problem with the model run. And everybody would say, okay, we're ready. And so sure enough, you know, this small change that was not going to affect operations invariably caused some major problem that we couldn't use it and we had to go back to start doing things by hand. That was in the 70s. So, you know, things that, it, you know, small tweaks that don't seem like they should make that much difference in the model on the ground can make a huge difference. And that's not something that the modelers who are never going to have to face a customer um, directly, a pilot, a guy on a ship who's really ticked because he's got water coming over the top of the bow, um, you know, they're never going to understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we have time for one last question. Does anybody want to 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 no, I don't see it. So I can end with a short um, curious and uh, gendered question. So um uh, uh, soon in your presentation, you showed uh, a photography of a woman using uh, uh, a weather balloon. Um, yes. So I am curious. Uh, um, so it, it is just anecdotic that the woman went, this particular woman went to the field, or is rather a representative of this um, uh, more uh, yeah, uh, larger trend in history of science of women doing those lower status tasks that men don't want to do. Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you think? Okay. Do? Yeah. So this the situation was this was during World War II. Me, oh, say probably 75 to 80 percent of all the uh, personnel who worked for the for the Weather Bureau had joined the war effort and were now part of either the Navy or the the Air Force Weather Service. And so for the first time ever, the Weather Bureau hired women, uh, which they had never hired women because they were considered a distraction. Um, much like the weather distracts modelers. Okay, so uh, so the women were brought in and taught to be, and trained to be observers uh, because that was your way in. I mean, there was really no place to meteorology at the time, and so they were brought in and they were all trained to be observers. And so she was trained to be an upper air observer, and so that's what she was doing. She was out there. The picture I didn't include showed the same woman several days later only she's trying to launch the balloon and the wind is blowing, oh, probably 15 to 20 meters a second. 
So, so the balloon is actually streamed out this way and she's holding it like this, like she's going to take off like Mary Poppins any second. And those balloons, I've been on the receipt, I've been on the holding on end of balloons um, uh, aboard ship and, and they're, and they're big and it takes like four people to hold them down, right? So everybody kind of leans in over the top of the balloon and then people step away and the last person holding the balloon has to remember to let it loose. Because if you're a lightweight person like me, like, you know, you know, like you're gone with the balloon. Um, so in her case, this woman was actually being pulled across the, this airstrip uh, while she was, because she, the, it, the wind had caught the balloon and she was just going with the balloon. Fortunately, she wasn't airborne, but, you know, like her feet were not all that far, you know, not, not cutting that close. But that's what they did. Um, now, there, during the war, the men who were trained to be meteorologists were all had to have a year of physics and a year of calculus to get into the program. And then it was like this one year crash course. The women who were accepted into the program all had to have master's degrees in a science to get into the program. And there were about 50 of them and they were trained um, separately. And then many of them um, stayed in the field, um, but had a very difficult time getting teaching positions. Uh, many of them worked as researchers because it just wasn't acceptable after the war to um, hire women scientists to work in universities. Okay, thanks, Christine. So uh, we see that Sebastian is leaving now and we have yeah. to leave uh, as well. Yeah, we have to leave too. Sebastian, yes. So we must close the discussion here. Um, it has been very stimulating and dynamic. So thank you everybody for being there. And remember that next week we have Sebastian who will be talking about uh, uh, the Antarctica um, and Changling will be commenting on his, uh, on his um, talk. Uh, so I hope seeing you all there and thank you, uh, thank uh, for everything.